Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I want to first congratulate the, the college on its, uh, on its birthday and the fact that you are a college that invites conversation. Um, and it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to thank Deborah Campbell, too, for the opportunity to come and, and, and talk with you about uh, some rather critical issues regarding energy and our pursuit of energy. Um, I hope to leave you with more questions than answers, um, but I also hope to leave you with a different way of thinking about energy, fundamentally. Uh, we need to think differently about energy and how we use it. And I also want to leave you with a different story, a different narrative about where we are in this world at this point in time. And this narrative, I guess, has a, has a number of points to it. I guess the first would be that the era of cheap energy is over and we're now hitting the hard stuff, much like Rob Ford in Toronto. Um, <laughs> Um, I, there's only one weather in Toronto these days, and it seems to be raining Ford Brothers everywhere. Um, yeah, remarkable. Um, so business as usual is basically over, as we know it. Um, we ha are replacing stability with volatility in all of our affairs. And at the root of all of this, the engine of it all, are a variety of transformations taking place in energy. The future of energy use is largely unpredictable, that many of you in this room will write that future. The flow of energy is what really matters on this planet, not the flow of money. And lastly, the other part of this narrative is that we do not yet know how to use energy wisely. So let's begin. And let's begin with, oh, turn it around and actually face it the right way. I have my energy slaves working for me right here. So the, let's begin with the British Columbia narrative. All right, Before, you know, you're, you're dead set in the middle of this amazing story where you have a government that's saying, Guys, we're going to make you all rich and we're going to send liquefied natural gas off to Asia and we're going to reap uh, an incredible bounty of $100 billion doing this and we have to do it really quickly and take advantage of this amazingly short window <clears throat> to, to pursue this, this new game, this new uh, gold rush for the province of British Columbia. And you have the government making all sorts of promises, saying, you know, we have this significant natural resource base and, uh, you know, we're, we're making tons of money from it. Um, and, and this is the government story. And they're saying, you know, look, look at this price differential between uh, the United States or the gas market in, the United, in North America versus the gas market in Europe and Asia. And if we just do this fast enough, get these amazingly high prices in Asia for our gas. Um, but there's another part to this story. So that's the government side. And here's the business community saying, well, you know, wait a moment. I don't know if this is going to work the way you think it's going to work. Given that Japanese and Korean firms are partners in several integrated LNG export projects in Western Canada, the returns in pricing for those projects will have to satisfy gas sellers and buyers alike to stand a chance even of being built. I might remind you, you are an energy colony. Even though you own these resources, you have largely sold them off to foreigners. And so what about the income? What about the, the great resources that you're going to reap from this shale gas boom in northern British Columbia? Well, here's the truth of the matter. Just look at this brown line here. Um, that's natural gas revenue. And you can see that, you know, it was pretty high in 2006, 2007, nearly $2 billion a year exceeded the income from the forestry industry in this province. It is now in steep decline and has gone into steep decline with, the, with natural gas prices. So, on, you know, and, and, and at the same time that you're earning less and less, well, let's just go back for a sec so you can see the rest here, uh, you're paying more and more in taxes. 
So what you're paying more and more in taxes to subsidize an industry that is delivering less and less income to the government of British Columbia. The subsidies are for roads. And this $840 million worth of subsidies has been given to the oil and gas industry since 2006. That's only one of the subsidies. There are many of them. The income, the net income you are now earning from this resource on an annual basis is around nine million bucks a year. So how the hell is this suddenly going to become a major billion dollar um, fairy godmother for British Columbia? So you've got this ongoing story as well as the pipeline stories. So let's take this story and let's put it inside this larger story of hydrocarbons. And remembering that we are all part of this story, this story is larger than 150 years old. If we include coal, it's about 350 years old. But we're all part of this story, and as a, and, and as a consequence, we find it hard to imagine any other way of viewing uh, this world. So oil is the world's master resource. Let's just take a quick boo at, at, at energy around the world and how it's being used. And what we find is that coal is still 25% of all the energy used on the planet. Then you've got oil at 37%, right? the, the dominant re resource, and that's actually going down. It was 40%. Then you have natural gas, 23%. It's actually going up. It was around 20%. You have nuclear at 6% and going down or staying where it is. Biomass, 4%. Hydropower, 3%. And then you have the renewables at less than 1%. And here we have a problem. We all know that we need to increase the share of this pie for renewables it took 150 years to make the pie look the way it is right now. The owners of this pie are not going to surrender their share of the pie without a big fight. This is a great illustration of the infrastructure that hydrocarbons, particularly oil, has produced in the United States. It is a map of all of the hazardous pipelines. I like how the Americans are very blunt and honest. They always use this hazardous pipelines. They understand that pipelines leak, they blow up, and all kinds of bad things happen with pipelines. Um, and this is a trillion dollar infrastructure, it took 150 years to build. Many of these pipelines are more than 50 years old. And do they leak? Yes, of course they leak. And where do they leak? They leak at terminals just as they would leak at terminals here in British Columbia. Um, so there are, are some aspects about this, this oil culture that you know, we should just talk briefly about. The first is it's dominated by largely by 10 corporations, ExxonMobil being number one. It is one of the world's largest corporations, bar none. It is the most powerful corporation in the United States, and it is the primary funder of the Republican Party. It was also the primary company, company that fought climate change persistently for 20 years. So the oil industry is about, well, it is the world's most lucrative industry by volume of commodity traded on an annual basis. It is liquid gold. We're talking trillions of dollars. We're talking about 10, it represents 10% of the global GDP. It employs only a small portion of the world's populace. And those people that work in the oil and gas industry are among the most privileged on the planet and make the world's, um, uh, among the world's highest salaries. We're also talking about a commodity that is increasingly becoming more and more volatile over time as it becomes more and more difficult to extract. So this volatility is something that we are going to experience on a steady, reliable basis for the rest of our lives. The era of, of when oil prices did not move much at all is long gone. And you can see this increasing and dramatic volatility as we chase after the more difficult and extreme hydrocarbons. 
All right, now let's just change this narrative. Okay, so this is the narrative that we're all part of, that we understand, and that we think energy is, you know, we'll go to a gas station and put it in our car, and we have these very simplistic, simple-minded, uncomplicated notions of what energy is all about. The ancients had a much more realistic, in-your-face appreciation of energy. And almost every ancient culture employed at one time slaves to get work done. And what is energy? Energy is the capacity to get work done. So we're using it as a fuel stock to feed energy slaves, largely machines. But the ancients, they were using grain as a feedstock to feed people to get work that they wanted done. And then if you lived at the top and you were the rich or you were king or whatever, then you would appropriate the surplus created by these people and live off that surplus. And the ancients had a very remarkable, and here I'm talking about the Greeks and Romans, a remarkable way to describe slaves. I mean, if you were a slave, you were socially dead, number one. I mean, you, you almost did not exist, and you did not exist because you were a speaking tool. That's what the ancients called slaves, speaking tools. And once you were introduced into a, to a household, um, I, I mean, you'd be captured, you'd be sold, and then you would be owned for 20 or 30 years uh, until you either died or until your master released you. And you carried with you all of your life the stigma of being a speaking tool. To the rest of the community, you were socially dead. Even in Aboriginal communities on the northwest coast here, where there was a great deal of slavery, you were known as the other. You were not one of the real people. You were one of the others. And you were expendable. And when you were buried, you would be thrown into the sea. So the ancients used slaves to do just about everything. These speaking tools were, they'd work in your household, they were primarily agricultural workers, uh, they did all the dirty work, all the heavy work, all the heavy lifting, and they were there to make life more comfortable. So one of the, one of the most amazing slaves I came across, and, and they were all different categories. I mean, they were, you know, some worked in the kitchen, some worked, you know, some provided entertainment, the hunchbacks and the dwarves provided entertainment. Um, and then there was this fellow called a nomenclator. And his job was to accompany the master down the streets of Rome. And whenever you forgot the name of some important person you were about to meet, he would, you know, gently whisper into your ear, well, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's Giorgio so-and-so, or that's Don so-and-so. And, oh, and by the way, there's a great spaghetti joint master just around the joint where we, around the corner where we can stop and have a, and he was a walking iPod for crying out loud. He was a GPS unit that accompanied you, and he, he, his memory, his function, was to help your memory when it was failing. And, uh, and, and, and so the, the diversity of tasks performed by slaves was extraordinary. But each and every one, their job was to make life easier for you. The average Roman, of course, didn't employ a lot of slaves, but the, the very rich had somewhere between 200 to even 1,000 slaves. Um, your average so-called Roman middle-class household, if you want, it, maybe had one or two slaves. Um, and, but this was the energy system that drove Rome. And slaves provided, of course, transport. If you wanted to go in the garden or go out in the streets, you would be carried by slaves. And uh, this was going on in Brazil in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, so Pliny the Elder put it this way. We use other people's feet when we go out. We use other people's eyes to recognize things. We use another person's memory to greet people. We use someone else's help to stay alive. The only things we keep for ourselves are our pleasures. You know? The army in Rome was kind of a modern day oil corporation. Their job was to go out and get the energy. All right, guys, you go out to Gaul. Uh, you go to North Africa. You bring home 70,000 slaves. We'll put them in the marketplace, and, uh, and, and that's how the army worked. And that was their primary job. And Rome got into big troubles when the army had to increase in size 
and, and despite its new size, was only capable of bringing home smaller and smaller packages of slaves. Largely because, you know, when they went to northern Scotland, and they went to Gaul, and they went to northern Germany, they were encountering a hell of a lot of resistance. A lot of people who didn't want to be slaves. Um, not surprisingly, and in fact, the Germanic tribes, they would kill themselves if they knew there was any, any, any chance of being captured by a Roman legion. They said, I will not die an unfree man in Rome. The system went on, you know, this, this system all worked as long as you could have massive energy returns, massive surpluses created, uh, being brought home by uh, this very expensive army um, who's, that became a real burden to, to the empire. Um, this is just a reminder that this kind of slave culture was also operated here in the Northwest where you had salmon cultures, cultures that were incredibly rich, incredibly diverse, all living off the energy of salmon coming through the, you know, your, your fantastic rivers in this province, um, which gave them great and enormous wealth, which allowed them, and a particularly titled um, people in, in many First Nations villages, to own slaves. And there was an active slave trade. So, all right, so that was our first experience in your face of energy. And this experience of, of slavery as an energy institution, and this is the argument I make, and I don't know whether it's right or not, but it's one that I'm thinking about more and more every day, has conditioned the way we use hydrocarbons today. We think it's okay to have a whole bunch of energy slaves providing us comforts. There was no abolition movement in ancient Rome. There was no abolition movement in ancient Greece. You talk to all the, philo the philosophers all said, well, what would we do without slaves? The same way presented with, with um, any energy debate today, oil and gas companies immediately, well, what will we do without hydrocarbons? What are you going to do if you don't have energy slaves providing you all the comforts that we are so that we've grown so used to. So, let's speed up a little bit. You know, we're we're into the the coal era, 17th, 16th century. Um, by the way, by the 17th century, on the planet, um, there were something like 750 million people, and the majority of majority of them were not free men and women. They were in one form of bondage or another. So along comes coal. We start harnessing coal, we start using it, mining the hell out of it, and then becomes the big transformation. We've got a problem. We're digging these mines so deep that they're filling with water. We have no way to pump the water out of the mines so that we can keep on mining coal to basically make metal or, or to keep homes warm. And so James Watt comes up with this invention, the steam engine, which is a great way to take a hydrocarbon, burn it, convert it in, uh, boil water, convert that water to, to steam, and use that steam as a pumping mechanism, which is then used to pump the water out of flooded coal mines. But then it is such a stupendous invention that it is quickly adopted and used by other trades. Where does this all happen? It happens in England. And what suddenly happens to England? Well, England becomes an empire on its own. So by 1824, England's steam engines puffed out 26,000 horsepower, the equivalent of nearly 750,000 men, or 100,000 horses. And by the 1880s, steam engines have multiplied so rapidly in every aspect of economic life in England that the engines had added the equivalent of 3 billion inanimate slaves to the global economy. And you wonder why you know, how that messed up, you know, the British mind, the, the British colonial mind, that, you know, we are a superior people and everyone else on this planet is dirt, you know, and, and their sense of their exceptionality was directly tied to the flow of energy they had unleashed in England with coal and the steam engine. 
The Americans did the same thing, but with another hydrocarbon. They did it with oil. And it transformed the American experience as dramatically as coal transformed the British experience with the Industrial Revolution. So here's the, the first big oil boom in the United States in Pennsylvania, 1850s. And this event was greater than the San Francisco gold rush. You had thousands and thousands of people pouring into the state of Pennsylvania to make their fortunes drilling for oil. And that's, that's how close the oil derricks were. And there were fires and conflagrations and um, uh, there was all kinds of larceny and theft and just as dramatic as, as anything you'd find in a gold field. But this was black gold. And so this resource at first then was, is used, was, was distilled and used as kerosene um, to, for, as a source of illumination. And it took about 30 years for people to figure out, well, wait a minute, all this stuff we're throwing away, the gasoline, which they were dumping into rivers, you know, we could actually use that and put it through a combustion engine. And then the revolution accelerates. And then throughout the United States, you have successive gold, uh, um, black gold rushes, you know, in Oklahoma, in Texas. This is Huntington Beach in California. Um, and so the United States then becomes, in a way, the Middle East for the globe in the 1920s and 1930s. California is a Kuwait and Texas is a Saudi Arabia in terms of oil production. Phenomenal revolution. Uh, John D. Rockefeller recognized this resource as a transformative resource. He said, look, this, this is going to reorganize business. And he certainly proved it with Standard Oil. Um, I can concentrate businesses when I have this much energy at my fingertips. I can standardize everything. I can destroy my competitors. And I can become enormously large. And I can be much more, more secret about my, my business. All of the things that characterize Standard Oil really have now characterized the modern American corporation. And then, okay, where you use oil for cars, and Americans have this love affair with this incredible energy slave. Um, and actually, the first people to adopt this energy slave in particular were doctors, rural doctors, and also rural populations in the United States. And, uh, you know, the jalopy becomes this, this, this phenomenal um, phenomenon where, uh, you know, every weekend you'd go out for a joy, joy ride. And, and, and the Americans just exuberantly embraced hydrocarbons. The names of automobiles, about 40% of their names in the 20s and 30s, all derive from the experience of slavery. I love this one. This, this, here's a vehicle that was actually called the Power Master. You know, there were other ones were called the Patrician. Extraordinary. So there was even an awareness at that time that we now have so much power at our fingertips, you know, and it's in this energy slave and I've got oil to feed it and off I go and I can do things that other mortals had never done before. And of course, this is, you know, became really the, the, the whole germ of the American experience and the American way where you have this massive um, mobility um, became the characteristic of American life. Then, you know, Buckminster Fuller, you know, the great nerdy scientist and, and, and father of the geodesic dome, thought a lot about these issues a long, long time ago. He's an absolutely brilliant guy. And he actually wrote in Fortune magazine in 1940 about this transform, uh, this change of the American experience. And he said, you know, go back to uh, 1810 and you'll find one million families in the United States and one million slaves. Most of those slaves were, of course, concentrated in the South, but actually there were a lot in the Northeast as well. So that worked out to about each and every family had at their disposal one slave to do the really onerous heavy lifting. So hydro hydrocarbons change that. Well, hydrocarbons then put at everyone's beck and call, I mean, this is kind of a democratic, democratic uh, um, development in some ways, every, every American had at their beck and call an average of 39 energy slaves of the 1940s. The exceptionality of the American experience, the arrogance of the American experience, then was 
based on this very basic change in the fact that each and every American could rely on a variety of different machines, some powered by steam, some powered by electricity, some powered by oil, to do all kinds of work for them. And this became the basis of the American empire and the success of the American economy. Because where did all of this cheap energy source, um, where could it all be found? It was found in the United States, the number one primary producer of oil at the time. So uh, Buckminster Fuller put together this marvelous map um, and in Fortune magazine, no less, where he's sort of talking about, he's got, got white dots, those are the people, and then he's got red dots, and they represent energy slaves. And on his map, it very clearly shows, and it's kind of hard to see here, but he was saying that, look, 56% of the world's energy slaves now reside in the United States. Just as 100 years earlier, more than 50% of the world's energy slaves had all resided in England. Massive change, really dramatic change. This was also one of the reasons why the Americans won World War II. They had more energy slaves at their disposal in terms of submarines, tanks, and ships, plus access to cheap fuel, and the Germans and the Japanese did not have that. They did not have the same number of machines, then they did not have access to these hydrocarbons. They were all oil imported countries. So a word or two about oil and, 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 and its energy richness, because I think it's in, in order to understand this story, you've got to understand that each barrel of oil represents around six billion joules. And if you're a normal person, you're thinking, what the hell is six billion joules? Well, here's a guy in a treadmill. He can produce 360,000 joules an hour. So a barrel of oil is really equivalent to the work of a slave in your household for 3.8 years in human terms. And that's taking the weekends off. And the average North American consumes 24 barrels of oil a year. So that's equivalent to around 89 slaves per person. A North American family of five therefore has 500 inanimate slaves at their beck and call. Um, go to China, the number of slaves is three, four. Africa, it's maybe half a barrel, if even that, or half a slave, if, if in most cases, no slaves. Um, a nation of 300 million then controls 26 billion energy slaves. No wonder the United States is, became the world's number one economic power. So let's even bring it down a bit further. What's in a gallon of gasoline? What's a different way of thinking about it? Well, next time you go fill up, think about this. One gallon equals 360 to 490 hours of strenuous work valued at $6,500. And what if we put a price tag on the geological work that was needed to turn this buried sunshine into hydrocarbons 100 million years ago, and you get a price tag of $1 million. All right, this is a finite resource. You will not see this resource again. I mean, this all happened 100 million years ago, and we've run out of the cheap stuff, and now we're hammering the hard stuff. All right, so let's talk a bit about I mean, one of the, the phenomenal things here is the mechanization of muscle. Right? Dramatic change that happened as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And I, I just want to say a few words about gender here just to throw this in. To, again, to get you thinking differently about energy and its flows and how it changes our behavior. So how did we define gender uh, hundreds of years ago? Well, go back and, and there's a growing consensus that it was defined by this tool the plow. And it took a man to move and, and, and to be harnessed to this thing and, and, and to get it going. A woman could not physically manage this instrument. And as a result, cultures that used this instrument, this tool, to grow food, which was at the time the primary form of fuel production and was all going into people's mouths, became very patriarchal. In contrast, cultures that use lighter instruments, like a stick or a hoe, were very matriarchal. <coughs> so you kind of had like the He-Man cultures and the 
and the she, she, she girl cultures, um, and really, really in interesting gender separation here, and 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 division of tasks, and definition of roles in society. Well, hydrocarbons blow this all up, right? They change all of this. So, uh, I mean, along come all these friggin' machines, one after another. And uh, here's my favorite energy slave, a chainsaw. Um, you know, along come trucks and airplanes and buses and heavy lifting equipment of every... Here's the most loathed energy slave on the planet. Uh, you know, uh, the infamous leaf blower, uh, whose emissions are equivalent to that of 50 cars and uh, a machine that can make as much noise as a jet engine and, and it, that accomplishes nothing, right? Just, um, what a futile exercise this is. It's no wonder it takes five guys, well armed, to move a pile of leaves around. I, I mean, if you, if you want to look at, at, a, at a great definition of, of how we abuse energy, there it is. Um, but, okay, so we start using all these machines. This then becomes a crisis for masculinity. Masculinity then used to be defined in so many ways as muscle power and how you use that muscle power. And uh, two great uh, um, oil historians in Texas put it this way, the Olians and their uh, uh, husband and wife team. And they said, look, in 1860, men were self-employed. By 1910, with the proliferation of energy slaves in both Europe and the United States, the majority of men were working <coughs> with machines. They were no def longer defining themselves as self-employed, but quite often as men who had lost their freedom and that were tied to the industrial mechanical world of the machine um, where you have to punch and punch out. And the Olean said this was a great calamity for masculinity, and I would say not only that, it is a calamity from which men have not yet recovered. All right, so what happened to women? Women in Canada, a similar phenomenon. This proliferation of labor-saving devices in the home, which invaded the home in the 1940s, 1950s. And these were logically uh, electrically powered. Um, and, of course, they were going to do the same thing for women that, you know, supposedly all these machines had done for men, make life easier. Uh, and more comfortable, and to have more slaves at your beck and call. Um, I mean, some of these old advertisements are, are quite stunning when you look at them. Um, here's my favorite. Here's the Whirlpool Miracle Kitchen, uh, which went to Moscow in 1959. And, and this kind of neatly illustrates uh, what, what was going on. And so here's the, here's the actual uh, description of this uh, uh, display in Moscow. So household chores in the future will be gone for the American housewife at the touch of a button or the wave of a hand. A floor cleaner will scrub, mop, vacuum, wax, or polish floors. Meals will be selected, cooked, and served in seconds, all automatically by remote control in the RCA Whirlpool Miracle Kitchen of the Future. A serving cart will walk to the table, load, scrape, wash, dry, and store dishes. You know, and this was the American dream. And so there was a great kitchen debate between Khrushchev and Nixon about all these gadgets. Um, and so Nixon said, I want to show you this kitchen. It's like uh, all of our houses in California. See that built-in washing machine? Khrushchev, we have such things. <laughs> Nixon, what we want to do is make more life more easy for the life of our housewives. Khrushchev, we do not have the capitalist attitude toward women. <laughs> you know? I love this. this is, I mean, this is great. Uh, um, but what do we find at the end of the 1950s? That after women have been bombarded with all of these machines, the house has become almost a, uh, a, a place to accommodate energy slaves and, and where women have to use them in and, 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 and so many very contrived, socially engineered ways. Well, we have women rebelling en masse, saying, what the hell is all this about? Life surely is not about waxing the floors with some new gadget. Um, and so then you have the feminine mystique. You have um, a social movement reacting to the proliferation of gadgets into the household and other issues as well. 
Then we have the next revolution coming up. So we have the mechanization of muscle, now we have the mechanization of mental activity, and this is the industrial revolution we're all trapped in at the moment. All right, 12 kilograms of fuel to make one kilogram of computer. All of this digital stuff that we marvel over uh, and that really control our lives um, is the product of cheap energy. And it is these um, um, uh, things where most of the energy is going. So you take one of these uh, microchips and the embedded energy in that chip already exceeds the energy consumption of a laptop during its life expectancy of three years. So you buy one of these things and you think, well, I'm not spending a lot of energy here, right? You know? Well, no, when you buy it, you've already spent all the energy. And it's all in those microchips. 83% of a computer's total energy use is dominated by its production. Not by, its, not by using it. And so digital gadgets, or digital energy slaves, are very much part of this hydrocarbon revolution. Although we, we somehow think that they're anonymous, that they're you know, outside of, uh, out of that, that world, when in fact they're not. And in fact, they're actually increasing energy demand in many households. All right, so how then have we used all of this energy? Well, we, we basically used it to enslave the planet, to do things we want to do, for good and for bad. The green lines represent roads that we've built largely with energy slaves. The white lines represent airline routes, another form of energy slave. The big red dots are all the urban areas we've created to accommodate all of the energy slaves doing work for us. And in the process, we have overmastered and overwhelmed the planet. So there are a number of calculations. So by some calculations, if we were to add up all of the energy slaves, whether electricity, nuclear, hydro-powered, hydrocarbons, we'd have on somewhere 226 billion energy slaves at the beck and call of humans. We've got at least somewhere between 22 and 26 billion energy slaves that are solely powered by oil. And if you were to put them per square mile, we're talking about 53,378 fossil slaves per square um, mile. I mean, so we have all of these, this invisible population beside, or an animate population beside the human population. We still have human slavery. These are human beings tied to machines making cheap shit for North American economy in China. You can go to websites where they will tell you when you buy whatever brand you're buying these days, um, how many slaves were involved in the production of those particular cheap goods and what kind of machines they were enslaved to. This massive profusion and proliferation of energy slaves, of course, is responsible for our massive growth in the consumption of energy that is beyond the pale. So since 1850, uh, population has grown 6.8 times. Per capita consumption has grown 10 times since 1850 in terms of energy consumption. And our total consumption has grown 70 times since 1850. As we add more and more energy slaves to our communities, our households, our businesses, we've used them to cut down forests at an increasingly rapid rate. We've used them to fish out, literally fish out major portions of our oceans. We've used them to deplete groundwater throughout Asia, the Middle East, much of the United States. And these are all diesel motors pumping groundwater for irrigation. We've used them to transport stuff right across the planet. So just 15 of these massive super tankers emit the same amount of greenhouse gases as the world's total car population because they're burning bunker oil, heavy oil, heavy crude. I'm always mystified, but then by, by this, you know, this class of people in this state of, you know, uh, uh, resolute denial that, well, then how, how could we possibly change the climate? 
Well, when you've got 226 energy slaves on the loose, and the majority of them burning hydrocarbons of one kind or another, yeah, we're going to change the energy balance on the planet and heat up the atmosphere. We have used these energy slaves to concentrate power. I mean, the world's 10 most powerful corporations, uh, actually ExxonMobil has just moved to the top here, but Walmart, Royal Dutch Shell, ExxonMobil, BP, Sinopec, that's a, a Chinese Asian refinery that's very anxious to control a lot of energy flows in this province. Uh, Toyota Motor, Chevron, Total, ConocoPhillips, on it goes. These are the world's largest corporations. They are all tied to oil. Oil has changed population patterns and growth on the planet. It's kind of the Viagra of the species. If you look around, you know, our numbers stayed below one billion until we hit hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons and the energy slaves that we could feed with them enabled us to break that barrier and become seven billion people in the space of 150 years. Surplus energy grows babies, makes surplus people. The problem is we're peaking out. All right, we've, we've, we've already mined all the cheap stuff and now we're hitting the extreme difficult stuff. And here's Colin Campbell, he used to work for Amico, giving a very neat illustration of what depletion is like at the end of the day. You know, you order a full glass of beer and before you know it, you're staring depletion in the face. And um, it's always a sorrowful event, I know, especially for university students. Um, and that's where we're at. And the next one is going to cost more and more and more and will be of lower and lower quality uh, brew. So we used energy to change all these energy slaves and hydrocarbons to change agriculture, flipped it upside down. Uh, here's um, Norman Borlaug, who uh, with money from the Rockefeller Foundation, no less, went to Mexico in the 1940s and came up with a way to redirect the energy flow through grain using chemicals, pesticides, irrigated water, the green revolution. Should, should have been called the oil revolution. Nothing green about it. Um, and it was dramatic. I mean, he would, he, by changing the energy flows so that the, the, the plant, um, he shrunk, essentially shrunk the plant so that more energy was directed into the grain head. Um, he changed bushels, the number of bushels from 30 bushels to 120 bushels. Amazing uh, um, uh, growth in production that helped make that population boom that we've seen. But here's the, the radical transformation that takes place here. So we have every calorie that's put on the table in the United States today, food calorie, takes 7.4 calories of energy or oil to get it there. So we're taking a form of production that it was one time dependent on careful practices, on sun, on, 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 uh, on careful rotation of crops, a sustainable system, and we've made it an addict to oil. Here's a, a perfect illustration. Barry Esterbrook uh, uh, used to be um, the editor of Equinox magazine, and, and he's an old friend of mine, and I've not seen him in years, but he wrote this marvelous book about tomatoes. And the tomato tells you the whole story of oil and agriculture in a very, very simple uh, way. So Barry was in Florida one day, and he was driving down a street, and the truck in front of him was full of t green tomatoes. And they were falling off the back of the truck. And they were bouncing off the road. And Barry stopped and, you know, he picked one up and he looked at it. He said, my God, there's not a, not a dent in this tomato, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we made tomatoes that can bounce. They taste horrible, but they can bounce, right? And, uh, and, and so then he began this exploration into what the hell we were doing. Well, we, we directed the energy flows for tomatoes. We changed their size. We changed their consistency. We made them uh, good for moving about and supplying fast food restaurants, but we removed all taste, all quality from this plant. Not only that, 
with cheap energy, we even started to grow them where the last place in the world you should ever grow a tomato plant. So the tomato plant comes from Mexico or perhaps Peru, arid, alpine country is where tomatoes grow best. But with cheap oil, you can do anything, right? So why not grow them in the swamps of southern Florida? All right, so that's 90% of, of America's tomatoes now come from Florida in the wintertime, between December and May. You know? And you're thinking, okay, well, that, that's bizarre, isn't it? Well, how can, you, how can you do that? Grow tomatoes in sand in a swamp when this plant was actually designed by nature to grow in semi-arid uh, high country. Um, well, here's what happens when you do that. You have 30% less vitamin C, 30% less thiamine, 30% less niacin, 60% less calcium, 14 times more sodium. Florida tomatoes require eight times more chemicals. 100 pesticides, all hydrocarbon products, are used to produce the remarkably tasteless tomato. In addition, Barry discovered that they were using slaves to produce these cheap tomatoes in Florida. Equivalent of 1,200 slaves actually were shackled to their rooms at night. These were people brought up from Mexico in the illicit slave trade that exists there to grow cheap tomatoes for New England markets. And that's the story of oil and agriculture right there. The cheapening of everything. We've used oil and our energy slaves and hydrocarbons to transform our cities. They used to look like this. This is a medieval city. Notice it was round. It had very well-defined limits. You know, you, you could walk it. The widest point was two miles. That was it. And now our cities are all designed to accommodate, not people, but cars or energy slaves with tremendous costs. In the United States alone, $230 billion a year is spent on medical costs, lost productivity, and travel delays due to traffic accidents and gridlock. We used uh, energy, this, this abundance of cheap energy from hydrocarbons to change our economic thinking. Economics used to be about scarcity, used to be about limits, used to be about real stuff, the fertility of the soil, the productivity of the land, the weather, and then suddenly it became this kind of mechanical mathematical operation where if you pulled one lever you got a rich man and pulled another lever you got a poor man. Now, this is Irving Fisher's illustration of how the modern economy worked uh, in the 1930s. He was a very famous Yale economist um, who very famously pronounced in 1929 that you know, the economy would go on forever and there would never be any correction. Um, F.S. Michaels, who's a, a marvelous uh, writer here, who's written a brilliant book called Monoculture, sums up very nicely what this, this new kind of mechanical thinking about economics has done. So it's all about self-interested individuals who buy cheap stuff made possible by cheap energy, and there'll be no limits to how big the world of markets can be. And that's the narrative that hydrocarbons has created for us. And every aspect of this narrative is incorrect. Because we are not self-interested individuals. We are actually altruistic individuals. There were people who questioned this economic uh, uh, narrative, uh, Frederick Soddy being one. He said, you know, you can imagine the economy being a steam engine. And you can pretend that it's all about the guys running it. Or you can pretend it's all about the markets being served by this machine, but you take the coal out of there and everything stops. And he said, energy is the prior consideration. Where it is derived from a man or a beast fed on food or from a machine fed by fuel is of minor import as regards the object, which is the production of wealth. And he said, wealth is a flow and it cannot be saved. We have changed politics with petrostates. We have all these exporting countries that are making enormous amounts of money, with the exception of Canada, selling their oil, because we're giving ours away. Um, <laughs> a very long practice Canadian experience. But all of these petrostates uh, have do crazy things. They lower taxes. They want to say, okay, we're going to run on this oil money. And 
welcome this volatility. And then we're going to overspend. We you know, we're, our budgets are all going to go to hell. We've had five deficits in a row in Alberta. Uh, we'll concentrate power because we've got the money and we're sitting on the hydrocarbons and obviously we have uh, more intellectual power than other people. Statecraft goes out the window because it takes scarcity to create statecraft. And then you fund political extremism. Um, when taxation is absent, populations tend to be politically inactive, relatively obedient, and surprisingly loyal. This brings us you know, to the American experience in a way, uh, because America was the first petro state in the world. And its oil production peaked in the 1970s. There's all this talk of America becoming oil independent again. I don't believe it. This is uh, a very temporary blip uh, from oil shale. It will not last long because of the rapid depletion rates. But anyway, it has created this illusion in the United States. But oil has always dominated American politics. So you've heard the story about the red states and the blue states. What you have not been told is that the red states have the hydrocarbons and the blue states are the oil importing states. So you can put these two maps over each other with the exception of California. You can see how politics flows in the United States and how it is tied to the flow of energy and the control of energy in the United States. Four presidents have come from Texas. No surprise there. Two of them were Bushes. <laughs> All right. So the story is beginning to change now. And it's changing because the quality of the energy we're using is declining. We've kind of hit this plateau in terms of global oil production because it's becoming more difficult to find and extract. Um, and in fact, that's, it's not just for oil. It's almost, this is going on for almost every resource on the planet, um, whether it's copper, whether it's coal. All of our reserves are declining in quality. So it's costing more energy, more capital, more environmental destruction to exploit them. You know, here we have to dig up two tons of sand to produce one barrel of oil. You know, as Jeff Rubin puts it, when you have to do that, you know you're at the bottom of the ninth inning. When you have to drill two miles underground and then another mile horizontally to fracture rock, the same consistency of concrete to release minute amounts of methane over vast geographies, you also know you're at the bottom of the ninth inning. That's hydraulic fracking. Look at the energy you have to assemble, the horsepower you have to assemble to do that. Offshore oil is a similar story. Again, you have to drill two miles below the ocean floor off the Gulf Coast. And this brings us then to, to an energy trap. And I think Ronald Wright would appreciate this. He would probably call it a progress trap. Uh, here I'll call it a, an energy trap tonight. And the best way to illustrate this is, uh, let's think for a moment that we're polar bears, right? a species that is endangered in this country. And what has happened is that here they are, they're feeding on ringed seal, majority of their diet, very concentrated period of time. They feed on these seals. These seals have contained blubber that has 80% of the heat value of oil, believe it or not. Right? So these seals are, are it's this incredible fuel stock for, for, for polar bears. This is what sustains these animals. And it's easy to capture these ring seals when there's ice. That's the platform to do the hunting, and the seals basically pop up, and you know the bear is waiting for them, and kaboom. And uh, everyone has a, a good feed, and just one seal will give a bear enough energy to run for eight days. And of course, they're eating more than that because they're storing up energy for a period of fasting that will take place afterwards. What happens when you move, remove that ice platform? The amount of energy the bear has to expend to find fuel dramatically increases, and the returns grow less and less. And it's kind of like, all right, taking all the food off the shelves in a grocery store, which is our platform for finding food energy. With the result that bears are now doing stuff they haven't done before. Here's, here's a bear 
because the ice flow is gone. He's now hunting mer eggs. And the number of mer eggs he has to consume to replace the energy value of a seal, we're, we're talking thousands and thousands of eggs. This bear is scrambling. This bear is in distress. This bear will not be able to reproduce. This bear will be losing weight. This bear is in trouble because its whole energy flow has changed as a result of the changes we've made to this climate, which again, we've changed the energy flow in the upper atmosphere. So here's the, the story on energy flows. Took one barrel of oil to find 100, 150 years ago, 100 years ago. Amazing surplus, phenomenal returns. We were like the bears sitting on the ice flow and thinking, oh, here comes a ring seal, boom, here comes another one. Wow, this is great. I, you know, I don't have to work very hard for this. And uh, now it's down to one on 20. So it takes one barrel to find 20. In the United States, it takes about one barrel to find 10. Where is it in the tar sands? Why are the tar sands not sustainable? A whole bunch of reasons, but here's the key one. Energy returns one on five for the mining projects. Energy, and, and if we go down, whoop. The energy returns for the steam plants are one on one. You can't run a civilization on energy returns, energy returns of one. Your civilization is at fundamentally over and is in full crash mode, in full descent. And so what we're seeing as we move down the hydrocarbon triangle, the resource triangle, we're hitting crappier and crappier stuff. We know this story in fishery stocks. You know, when you start dragging the ocean floor for sea cucumbers, that's what bitumen is. It's a sea cucumber. And our energy returns and are getting less and less. We're having less surplus energy to play with in society. So what does that mean to science? What does that mean to universities? What does that mean to, to social services? What does that mean to education in general? Less surplus to play with. And so our economy will look more and more like this. So there's the red. That's the amount of energy we need to get the full energy flow to create the system we have, and now it's dramatically changing. As, we, as the energy system we have takes more and more lower quality energy and more capital to keep it running. And that's why I would argue that the world is going to shrink and not expand. That all the forecasts of, of global growth, which don't incorporate energy, I mean, we've taken energy almost out of every economic equation, um, just don't get it. And so the world is not going to look like that. It's going to look like this. Here's an economist, a very prominent American economist, acted sort of saying the same thing. He says, is U.S. economic growth over? And he makes this observation. He says, you know, we've got debt, we've got inequality, our demographics are changing, we've got uh, you know, problems with energy flow and cost and, and education and globalization. All of these issues are hitting us like major headwinds and here's the issue. You can see this remarkable growth in GDP all happening when we hit hydrocarbons. And as the price of hydrocarbons begin to escalate, we can see all this growth declining. And so here he, 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 he poses the heretical conclusion. There was virtually no economic growth before 1750, suggesting that the rapid progress made over the past 250 years could well be a unique episode in human history rather than a guarantee of endless future advance at the same rate. And he's absolutely right. Here's Tullet Preben. This is a, you know, a big uh, uh, investment house in England saying exactly the same thing. They said, well, and if it's all true, what are we going to see? What will be the decline markers? Energy sprawl, agricultural volatility, rising energy prices, global stagnation, inflation. Almost every food commodity on the planet is going up in price, from grain to rice, from corn, soybeans. Energy sprawl. This is East Texas. This is the Eagle Ford Shale. This is what Northern British Columbia will look like if it is, if all these LNG projects go through. You will have a landscape as fragmented is that. 
energy price escalations by 20 to 30 percent in England and other countries. And here's Tullet Preben saying, the economy as we have known it for more than two centuries will cease to be viable at some point within the next 10 or so years, unless, of course, some way is found to reverse the trend of declining energy returns. So here's Joseph Tainter, a great U.S. anthropologist from Utah, saying, well, here's, here's the issue. We've used cheap energy and our energy slaves to build more and more complexity. And we've built this stairway. And we're at the top of this stairway. And every time we encounter a problem, we always solve it by spending more energy. But this energy is becoming more and more expensive. Because of the connection of energy to problem solving, we will not stop using fossil fuels until we are forced to. I would say also because of their connection to creature comforts, we will not stop them until we are forced to. So let's end by just looking at the future and what are some of the possibilities. All right, so business as usual is over. Things are changing. Here's Fred Cotterill, brilliant U.S. sociologist in the 1950s, contemplating all of these things, saying, the growth of centralized government will stop and wither. Moreover, the energy descent will unleash endemic conflict. Those whose greatest advantage is in the marketplace will struggle to protect it. That sounds like the pipeline battles going on here in BC. The good news in terms of the future is, is this simple observation, is we certainly don't need as much energy as we use. Most of it is we, we waste. And we can live quite happily and quite comfortably with seven barrels of oil per person a year or energy equivalent and have a very high standard of living. Vlaclav Schmil, who's a, a great sort of energy analyst at the University of Manitoba, has come up with these conclusions. He said, you know, high energy spending doesn't give, give you prosperity, does not deliver quality, doesn't ensure security, does not enrich culture, does not promote stability, does not increase diversity. It does not guarantee anything except greater environmental burdens. You got that one right. What do we know about energy forecasts? They're almost all inaccurate. You know, Philip Tetlock did this amazing experiment and basically said, you know, if you were to take a bunch of chimpanzees and give them darts uh, and they were throwing them at forecasts, uh, the, the chimpanzees had a better chance of being accurate than uh, the energy forecasters themselves. So whenever you, you come across an expert saying, I know what the future is going to be, he's bullshitting you. He has no idea what the future is going to be. The future is volatile. The future will be unpredictable. The future is not yet made. because we can't deal with these things, complexity and uncertainty. And there's, Mother Nature is always throwing us a curveball that we never expected. But let's look at two, two interesting examples. Let's look at Cuba and let's look at North Korea and about what happens when you turn off the tap. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, 1990, Cuba just at that time was getting you know, more than half of its oil and 80% of its food from the Soviet Union. The union collapsed, and with it, their oil supply and 80% of their food. This was a major, major crisis in Cuba. They called it the special period. Everyone in Cuba remembers this time. The average Cuban lost 10 kil kilograms because the number of food calories that they were, were, were around just disappeared off the table. No more pork from the Soviet Union. Um, so wages dropped tremendously. Tens of thousands of people went blind from not having adequate nutrition. This is an enormous crisis in, 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 in Cuba. And so it forced the Cubans to rethink everything. And so the state, which had supported this kind of industrial agriculture, where we're exporting sugar or tobacco or citrus uh, to global ports, but we're not growing food for our own people, said, whoa, wait a moment, we've got a problem here. And then they went, actually went back to their remaining peasants in the country and said, how do we do this? How do we feed people? Because we don't know how to do it anymore. And not only that, you know what? Maybe all these centralized markets, maybe that's not a good idea too. Maybe we'll allow you to sell some of this food and to keep the cash. How's that? And the peasants said, you know what? We know how to do all that. And they brought in some Australians who are experts in permaculture. And they said, okay, 
Let's open this whole thing up and let's get going, guys. Let's roll up our sleeves. And they had gardens on top of roofs, and they had growing chickens and on, on tops of buildings, and every available inch of space in Havana suddenly was converted to these marvelous uh, vegetable gardens. And the diet of the average Cuban suddenly, you know, also changed dramatically. You know, all this fat and, uh, and green and, and heavy meats from, from the Soviet Union were replaced with vegetables. Huge, huge change. Um, and with it, you, you had this community response. So you had production of food by the neighborhood, for the neighborhood. It was remarkable transformation. So the, the Cubans re, re responded to this crisis of turning off the oil tap uh, by really relying on their old barrio traditions of community. How are we going to help ourselves out of this mess, guys? And in the process, they created this, this organic food revolution, uh, not by choice, but by they were forced to, had to. Um, and here's just an example. You know, here's Cuba in the United States. Here's the amount of energy used per person in Cuba. I mean, it's minuscule compared to what the Americans. So that's one story. So that's, that's how one way you can respond to a dramatic energy descent. Here's another way. North Korea. So how did the North Koreans respond? Because they, too, were getting all their oil and food from the Soviet Union. Totally different response. Famine and repression. So they were high energy spenders and a lot of this energy was being used in agricultural, industrial agricultural production. That all went out the window with the consequence that grain production dropped, fertilizer dro dropped, electronic supply dropped, oil supply, which was the key to all of this, dropped coal. And of course they started burning their forests like mad. More than a million people starved to death. And the government, instead of reaching out to communities, redirected the remaining flow of energy to these guys. Right? I've never seen people decorated like that before, but um, we know who's got the energy in this picture, right? So there you have two radically different responses to dramatic changes in the flow of energy in societies. So where does this leave us then? What do we need to, to be thinking about? Well, we're, we need to first of all acknowledge that we're, we're shackled. We're shackled people and that we are shackled to all kinds of energy slaves in our daily lives. And we need to fundamentally ask, our, ask ourselves, how many slaves do we really need as human beings? We all need to go on energy diets, uh, particularly the Ford brothers. Um, we have um, used energy to build big things, big corporations, big governments, big economic unions. Low energy spending suggests to me that small will become beautiful and that these big things will dissolve, they will collapse. Leopold Kor put it this way, he said, you know, and he was a great uh, Austrian economist in the 1970s and a great friend of Ivan Illich. If a society grows beyond its optimum size, its problems must eventually outrun the growth of those human faculties which are necessary for dealing with them. No kidding. Hence, it is always bigness and only bigness which is the problem of existence. The problem is not to grow, but to stop growing. The answer, not union, but division. We used high energy spending to become incredibly materialistic, just as the Romans did. Will low energy spending result in a new spiritualism? This is uh, St. Benedict, who of course walked away. His, his parents were wealthy Romans and slaveholders. He walked away from Rome and he started a religious community based on human labor and getting work done with human hands in an attempt to lift the stigma that slavery had left on human work. We've used high energy spending to accelerate the pace of life. Low energy spending just might slow things down an awful lot. We've used high energy spending to individualize every aspect of life, to alienate ourselves, isolate ourselves, you know, we are a communal people. We are a tribal people. 
and we have disassociated our social roots and tried to turn us all into these fine, upstanding libertarians, again, like the Ford brothers. And, uh, you know, maybe we need to rethink that. Maybe families and communities have the best kind of energy available to all of us. You know, we have a society where we throw everything away. Maybe we should use it up, wear it out, make it do. World War II motto. We've used high energy spending to create huge, massive amount of quantity of crap to crowd our lives. Maybe low energy spending will return us to quality. You know, what a marvelous gift that would be. We used <laughs> a, a high energy spending, of course, to distract ourselves and entertain ourselves to death. We've used, uh, you know, and maybe we will, you, low energy spending will get us focused again. We use high energy spending to burn through our uh, economic um, um, functions like fire. When in fact, maybe we should be learning how to grow like trees. That that is maybe the only kind of growth we can really handle. So, who knows where hydrocarbons are all going to take us? They are the masters at the moment. They want to remain in... The people who own those hydrocarbons or own the companies that develop those hydrocarbons want to remain in control for as long as possible. Human nature. The challenge is how are we going to, to change this? How are we going to force a new direction? Will it be forced by Mother Nature? Will it be forced by human conflict? Will it be forced by human protest, the way the abolition movement ended the, the slave trade? Who knows? I don't know yet. But I'll end with this thought. Inequity, haredness, and impotence appear everywhere once voracious hordes of energy slaves outnumber people by a certain proportion. The energy crisis focuses concern on the scarcity of fodder for these slaves. I prefer to ask whether free men or free women need them. So thank you. the energy flows a bit. Um, speak up as clearly as you can, Amanda, if you could repeat the question. We'll do the benefit of everybody. Um, gentlemen there. Uh, there's a major uh, um, counter-offensive underway now uh, against a hydrocarbon-based economy. Uh, and, and yes, uh, the, the, uh, the hydrocarbon aristocratic uh, based economy is, is sure to collapse uh, and is doing so as you, uh, as you so uh, graphically illustrated. But do you, do you think we still have enough time uh, to transform ourselves uh, into, a, into a, a more renewable based economy before our whole civilization and our environment collapses? We don't have time, very much time left. The question is, do, do we have enough time to make a transition to a lower carbon, lower energy spending um, civilization, if we want to call it that? Um, well, <laughs> who knows? I, I mean, I, I cannot answer that question. I, 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 would say, I would say this, though. I, in some aspects, yes, be, when, you, when you look at the figures, we've run out of time in terms of building the infrastructure we need for renewables, and, and renewables alone won't do it, but we're also going to have to dramatically reduce demand for hydrocarbons at the same time. Um, we're, we're not on that program. We're not there yet. Um, so I think we will experience a number of emergencies and crises that will get us going. Um, it won't get all of us going. And 
in terms of the, the, the basic question, are, are we out of time? Being the father of three children, I can't afford to think that way. So I have to think hopefully. And all I know is that despair only serves the status quo and that I'm going to make the best use of the time I have left to get the things done that need to be done. Hey, my name is Gene, and those of you who took our leaflets know that I'm an eco-socialist. And I want to assure you that I do not have a capitalist attitude towards women. <laughs> 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 or men, for that matter. Um, I uh, wanted to pick up on a couple of things that Andrew uh, raised in that incredibly uh, rich uh, Thing. Early on, you showed us a pie chart and said that the guys who owned most of the pie chart were not going to give it up uh, without a fight. So I'm here among a, a small group of people in Vancouver, and there are more and more people across the world now that are starting to organize for the fight to make them give it up. Uh, and it's not going to be an easy fight. It's not going to be a pretty fight. More people than you have, it, it's going to help. Um, the second thing that you said that's important is um, What's going to happen? What are we, how are we going to do without all this energy? Well, that's going to be how we replace those guys and how we replace the system that they own and run. And that's going to take a lot of people. And I would suggest that people at a university have a particular place in that work for a number of reasons, three reasons. One is you deal with young people and the ways that they are starting to think about the world. Two is that you have authority to contradict some of the political and corporate leaders who lie regularly. And three is that you just like have the ability to study and figure out stuff that we're going to need to know as we go forward. Would you like to answer for the university, Andrew? <laughs> sure, Mark, I'll let you do that. <laughs> I think we should take those points. Uh, but get back to some questions while we have time for that with Andrew here. Um, please, qu questions as concisely as you can so we can get as far around the room as possible. Don and then the guy behind you. Don, you. I went to a lecture a couple of weeks ago, another environmental minister, and he talked about a, a, a couple of uh, points of optimism, a kind of place of optimism. The one that stuck out for me is there's enormous uh, wind farms that are being created in China, creating enormous amounts of energy. So it would seem to me that, of course, that's in contradiction to the way forward that you're recommending, which I'm sympathetic to small local community. Mm -hmm. But perhaps the next stage is uh, replacing uh, the hydrocarbons with renewable energy, but large, big uh, centers of production. Okay, so the question is um, do we replace hydrocarbons with large industrial like renewable <coughs> projects, whether we're talking about massive wind farms or huge? solar installations or even geothermal installations. Um, I, I have a bit of a problem with that um, in the sense that if we use renewables the same way we have used hydrocarbons, uh, we will have the same problems at the end of the day. And um, I've got 3,000 windmills south of my uh, land in southern Alberta in Pincher Creek, um, and these wind farms have been just put up willy-nilly uh, with little regard for uh, birds, bats, aesthetic issues, or whatever. And, and when you start looking at the research on massive wind farms, as opposed to smaller local projects that are there to serve the local community, as opposed to being exported somewhere else, um, you begin to find that there are all kinds of issues with wind. Um, and, uh, you know, it can change precipitation patterns. Um, it can have a lot of unexpected and unintended consequences. Um, if we were to replace, I don't know, there have been some uh, interesting studies that have looked at, okay, if the United States were to replace the majority of its fossil fuel consumption um, with wind farms, that these wind farms um, would have such a powerful impact that they would change the climate in the North Atlantic. Right? So there's a limit to how many wind farms we can, we can build. If we're going to use the same industrial model that we inherited from hydrocarbons to apply renewables, we're going to end up with all kinds of unintended consequences and huge environmental footprints. You know, and I, I could go on and on about all of the renewables. I support renewables in, in every possible way I can 
but I also understand that there are limits and that most of these renewables also come with huge footprints. And, and, and I'll leave you with this last thought that all of the renewables we're talking about today are extensions of fossil fuels. You have to burn a lot of oil to put up a lot of windmills. Extending moratorium on fracking in Quebec and all the news happening in the Maritimes. What are your thoughts on BC and, and why it seems to be such a subdued reaction to what is going to be a massive development in the Northeast? Okay, so the question is, there's a moratorium on fracking in Quebec. Um, there is really very limited discussion on this issue in British Columbia. Why are British Columbians so low-key on, on this issue? Um, I think there, there are a number of reasons. One, for number one, the, um, an, the companies that went into Quebec wanted to frack the St. Lawrence Valley, one of the most productive farmlands uh, in the province that have been uh, uh, actively farmed for nearly four generations. They walked into a hornet's nest. They walked into communities that said, look, there's no way you're going to mess with our water, destroy our landscape, and displace us as long-term residents on this landscape. What's happening in northern BC, it, similar things are happening in, normally in, in northern BC. They're affecting a much smaller group of people, largely First Nations, and communities that have only been there for two generations, or three, you know, not, but nowhere near as long as the 300 years that you find in the, in the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, as a right, it, it, it is out of sight, out of mind. So most people in Vancouver have no idea, no conception of actually what hydraulic fracking looks like, what impact it might have on groundwater, uh, what kind of uh, uh, air pollution it might send down wind, what kind of fragmentation of the landscape it will leave behind, the intensity of the operation. I mean, if you can imagine for a moment having 600 trucks drive by your house for a period of three months, how would you feel about the dust, the traffic, the accidents, uh, the occasional run over child? Um, that gives you an idea of the intensity of these kind of operations. So part of the problem is, is that most people in the southern part of BC know very little about northern BC. The development there is largely being controlled and shepherded either by Albertans or by foreign corporations. Um, and what needs to happen is that people who live up there need to come down to southern BC and tell their stories and give you a picture of what is happening to that landscape. Take one from the other room. Uh, Joy, Joy, were you just waiting or did you have a question? No, nice, nice to see you. The lady on the other side of the aisle, please. Go ahead. Yes, you. Okay. Um, I'm standing so I can my question is about when you were talking about shipping agriculture and how we think about it and going from being more focused on exporting all our agricultural products to make money, growing locally to feed local populations, which I agree it works in some cases, such as in Cuba, but Cuba was really fortunate that they live in an area where their soil is fertile and the climate is good for agriculture. So I was thinking that there are some communities in the world that where the crop yields are already low naturally, like countries that of large desert landscapes and such, so how can you expect with their rising population and their declining crop yield due to climate change, how can you really expect them to survive if everyone starts using their food locally? Like someone needs to be exporting to support those communities as well. So okay. Okay, very interesting question. Because the question is, all right, so let's say um, uh, you live in a part of the world where climate change has dramatically changed precipitation patterns and you now find yourself without a reliable food supply, um, how will the relocalization of agriculture in other parts of the world, um, what will that mean, right? What, how, how will that affect those kind of countries? Whoa. Um, that's where it really gets complex, you know, um, because we're beginning to see that all over the world. And we're, see, we're seeing shifting precipitation patterns, changing um, uh, agricultural production patterns um, 
throwing all kinds of different places in, into uh, full panic mode. Um, at the same time that we are using in increasing numbers of, of food stock as a fuel stocks, also raising the prices of, 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 of food. I don't know if the solution is more globalization. Um, I, I certainly don't think we can construct any more complexity than we already have. Um, I mean, right now we're 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 we're, we're, we're you know we're, we're we're responding to these problems by taking whatever surplus we can find in other parts of the world and sending it over and say here, you know, this will help you out for a little bit. Um, at a certain point, that whole system will collapse. Um, and if and when it does, you better have a really good local food production base employing large numbers of people using a diversity of methods and practices um, on the landscape. And that is your best insurance. It has always been our best insurance for foul weather. I can see you there, Terry Bird. Um, I've actually got two questions dealing with governance issues. Run them together as quickly as you can. Yes, well. The TPP that seems to be linked by WikiLeaks and the agreements of trade that's happening between Canada and the United States, Australia and New Zealand, several Asian nations, that seems to be like a major <coughs> corporate grab to try and strangle the economy out of more resources. I'd like your thoughts on that. And the other part is... Okay, I'm sorry, what is the agreement again? Uh, I think it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Partnership. Okay. Uh, WikiLeaks brought it up uh, about a month ago. They started making some of the documents. Okay, but, uh, my answer is really short because I know nothing about it. So, okay. okay. Second question is the BC government wants to rush to export liquid natural gas. Will that not raise the price of natural gas that exists in BC to about 70% of the world level? Because that's what it's going to compete against. You're going to use about a third of the natural gas to compress it. Yeah. So. Okay, so the question is, well, if BC really gets into the LNG market and starts exporting its natural gas to Asia, will that not raise the price of natural gas substantially for British Columbians? Yes, it will. And that's exactly what happened in Australia. Natural gas prices went up by 70% um, as Australia now exports 90% of its natural gas. And Australians are hopping, hopping mad about it. Uh, they're hopping mad about a whole bunch of, 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 of issues related to the push to export uh, liquefied natural gas uh, in Australia. If you really want to understand what, what could happen to British Columbia, you need to look at the whole Australian experience where they've invested $200 billion in LNG uh, exports. Again, largely to Asian markets. I like the last. The uh, nuclear question. I know that you had a little chart which had nuclear on the yep. rim there. Uh, if you start burning uh, ordinary uranium and thorium, which you can't do in breeder reactors, the EROI increases dramatically. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the nuclear, nuclear option? option? Okay. Uh, the question is, what are my thoughts on the nuclear option? Um, in particular, what the third or fourth generation nuclear reactors might be able to deliver in terms of very high energy returns and, uh, and reduced uh, radiation risks. Um, there's a huge debate going on uh, uh, about this very issue in the environmental community where you have people like uh, climate scientist Jim Hansen saying, um, it's too early to say no to nuclear. Uh, we're going to need some nuclear power, uh, particularly in this transition period. And um, I think he makes a, a, a good argument. Um, I certainly wouldn't be prepared to close um, all of the doors, but I have yet to see yet a, a commercial operation that uses nuclear in a different way. Um, we know that it is among the world's most expensive energy. Um, 
we know that it also comes with kind of this high priest class of technicians needed to manage all of this power and that there are a lot of moral issues about investing so much power in so few individuals as we've seen uh, with uh, you know a Tokyo Electric in Japan and uh, uh, so we, we've got to deal with the economic issue uh, we've got to deal with the with the moral authority and power and corruption issue associated with having this, this much power on the loose um, and yet at the same time I'm I'm not prepared to say no if somebody can come up with a thorium reactor that makes sense that not going to cost the farm then we should consider it but we should also have a strong moral debate about what it means to have access to that kind of energy because it is corrupting we have time for two more questions there was somebody there in the, just behind Ellie is it is that Makoto? That, that's been covered. Then, yes, the back, the very back. Yes, you. So, my question is you said yourself that energy feeds babies and that you have three children, and so presumably there's a body energy slave in your three children, rather than two. And I also have many hypocrisies within my own privileged sphere. I can imagine every single person in this room has a lot of beyond their seven barrels of ener energy a year for the privilege to be where we are right now. And so I'm wondering what your response is to uh, the, I mean, I understand there are many small countries now that are aligned with China in their ask to the world that has allowed themselves to have embodied energy slaves up to until now, and then right now saying, well, now is the time where we will need to disengage from energy slavery. So. I, my question is just around what is the response from why since we're now having to craft, therefore at the least all this engage because energy is no longer easy for us. There are still places in the world where they can outrun us essentially that technologically maybe they can win the energy slavery theme, right? So okay. All right. So the question it's a good question and it really about um, all right, so we've kind of peaked in North America and we have all of these energy slaves. Um, if we are to disengage, then would that not throw the advantage to emerging economies such as India and China, uh, which have huge numbers of people as well as growing number of, of, of energy slaves? Is that, have I got that right? Okay. And also, and, and, and the point being made too, that are we not all sort of uh, walking bundles of contradictions in terms of how we use energy? Um, and I would say... Okay, well, are you asking, are you asking the equality question too? Do you, you know... Well, I'm just wondering what your response is to that. Okay. All right, so, I mean, obviously the wealthiest energy slaveholders on the planet are Europeans and North Americans, and the poorest are, are really the rest of the world. Uh, we've got China coming up strong saying, we want to challenge that position. Um, the resources are saying, China can't really go up and India really can't go up unless North Americans go down a bit. Um, the, um, and there are a whole bunch of issues here. So number one is North Americans and Europeans and their burning of fossil fuels have taken um, climate change to the brink. We are responsible for the bulk of emissions. Um, does that mean then that India and China have no moral responsibility? No, absolutely they do. But we have not demonstrated much moral leadership on this issue. And as long as we don't, um, those emerging economies are going to say, look, if you're not going to clean your house, we're not going to clean ours. And in fact, we're going to copy your experience and the worst excesses of your experience. Um, then there's the, the whole equality issue. Well, you know, we have these great middle class lives here. Don't, you know, aren't the Chinese entitled to the same way of living? Um, no, not if it tips the balance and not if it requires an authoritarian regime to, you know, to control it and manage it. Um, I mean, the, the displacement of people in China is absolutely extraordinary. It's like going to England 
in the 18th and 19th century. And um, uh, so, I, I, mean, I mean, your question is, is an excellent one. And do we start giving up energy slaves first? Do we have to set an example for the rest of the world? Or can we learn from other parts of the world um, and, 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 and do with less? And maybe reconnect to the importance of energy in our households, in our communities, um, into different ways of doing things. There are so much opportunities for us to cut back. I mean, 50% of our food supply goes into the garbage. You know, just that's an enormous amount of oil that's just being badly used. Just like so many of, of the heat generated in our combustion engines is going out the tailpipe, is not even going to drive the machines that, that we own. But you know, fundamentally, our big issue is is that we are at, we are at sea. We don't want to acknowledge that we even have a problem with the way we abuse energy, and the way we have used energy is to become more like gods and a lot less like people. That would be a great line on which to pause. But there's one more question. <laughs> I read somewhere, and I, I am sorry I can't uh, bring up the source, that um, Homo sapiens, like our species, does think, but prefers not to think so far into the future. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to me, from the way um, all the indicators are, that we have to change now, you know, from our parents on higher departments. Yet, in our province, in our um, federal election, there are overwhelming majorities to the political parties who promise prosperity based on hydrocarbons and the old models. And there's also a lot of disengagement from young people with the electoral uh, you know, uh, uh, situation. And so are we caught by being who we are, homo sapien, in, in this kind of uh, cycle where we will not um, give up the idea of this you know, prosperity over what is really happening. In other words, we prefer um, short-term promises and short-term gains over having to change. Okay. But the question is, as homo sapiens, are we not sort of wired to, to think short term? And are we not sort of wired to go for the easy solutions, and um, such as that promised by the government of British Columbia, which promises prosperity with the export of, of natural gas? And so I think there are really two questions here. The first one um, is the, I'm sorry? No, it's okay. okay. Um, we are wired to be, we are short-term thinkers. Uh, and we also have the capacity for uh, incredible denial. Um, and this denial serves us very well, has helped us in evolutionary terms. I mean, we can deny death, the finality of death, and, you know, allows us to do a lot of innovative, creative, and productive things. Um, but when that kind of thinking uh, is applied to climate change, then we are really doing a lot of very destructive things. Um, whether we will correct our thinking before climate change corrects our behavior is, is a big question. All right, so the second part of it, you're saying, well, okay, well, you know, isn't it our good old human nation, nature to sort of say, geez, you know, hydrocarbons, lots of revenue, uh, the government is promising pros prosperity. Isn't that great? Um, Yes, governments can make a lot of money from hydrocarbons. That's why governments love hydrocarbons, right? They don't have to work for them. Very little effort involved. All they have to do is a couple of taxes, a little bit of royalties and rent, and they've got this amazing stream of revenue. And then they can use this stream of revenue to make you all feel fat and comfortable um, and say, look, we're going to lower your taxes. 
and then we're going to run on, on, on these hydrocarbons. And, um, and what they should really be saying is, you know what, guys, we're going to stop taxing you, and if we're going to stop taxing you, we're going to stop representing you, and we're going to be representing the hydrocarbon uh, developers in this province. That's how Alberta is run. That's who represents, my government in Alberta represents, doesn't represent Albertans, it represents the hydrocarbon developers who pay 30% of the government bills. They pay a third of our schools, a third of our hospitals, a third of our roads. I am a subject in a province where you cannot say no to hydrocarbon development because my government is addicted to hydrocarbon revenue. You don't want that because that, it will destroy what democracy is left in this province and it will destroy much of northern BC. And it could possibly destroy your coasts and at the same time what are you doing? You're destabilizing the atmosphere and your local climate. And don't forget the freshwater. The freshwater Shale gas in this province uses three times more water than any other shale gas reserve on the planet. You will turn northern BC into a desert if you proceed with, with, with the plans that have been offered up by this government. With no risk analysis, with no cumulative impact analysis, with nothing. There's no white paper on what this all looks like. I've never seen anything quite like it, although this is how we do business in Alberta too. I just wanted to add that I've seen lots of pictures when where head of that plow was a team of women, women pulling the plow. Yes. So you know, there's sort of, that could still be patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> some of those women were that was the only thing they could do because they couldn't. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, thank you for doing so.